thanks Peter for the introduction. Thanks, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I give the usual warnings, even though it's kind of way to give them uh, in a virtual seminar. So feel free to interrupt me if you have any question, if anything is unclear. Um, things are supposed to be clear unless I especially mention that they should not. Uh, so yeah, feel free if anything should be clarified. Also, I tend to speak a bit fast. So again, feel free to mention if I should slow down or anything, like just, you know, unmute your microphone and ask away. Um, yeah, so I want to talk to you about um, the asymptotic dimension of, of a graph class. So that's a slightly unusual concept, but it is not necessarily unusual, but something that's not so well known uh, in graph theory. So I will try to introduce things slowly and hopefully convince you of how important aesthetic dimension is. Uh, so this is all joint work with Nicolas Bousquet uh, from Lyon, Louis Perret from Grenoble, Carla Grenland from Oxford, François Pirot also from Grenoble, and Alex Scott from Oxford. So let me let me first be very vague. Like, you know, it's it's a definition which is a bit technical, so I want to kind of introduce you very slowly to it. So let's forget about graphs, let's talk about spaces or something. Like imagine whatever space you want to be in. Say our goal, like to, to have a small dimension, our goal is to cut the space or the something in small pieces for a good definition of small, so that there is little contact. So you want like around every point to not see too many different pieces um, around yourself, say. And dimension is exactly like the max contact you can have one 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 point so it's going to be well it's max contact minus one it's always a little tweaking just like for true weight or something so let's get, let's take a simple example just to see what could that mean let's look at reels so you have the line of all reels and you kind of wonder okay how can i cut this in small pieces so that there is a uh, little contact well it's kind of natural that you can't just take the whole thing as one piece because that would be you know not a small piece so you have to cut it in uh, smaller things. And one natural thing to do is just like alternatively, um, I mean, have alternative intervals of, you know, arbitrary length, but like small length, say. And this way you can see, well, you can make everything as small as you like. And around, around every vertex, the most different pieces you can see is two. So you'd have uh, dimension exactly one. And again, like it's not really hard to convince yourself that this does not have dimension zero. There's no way you can do this so that you never see more than one piece uh, around the point. Okay, so that's a simple example. Let's see something a little bit more complicated. Uh, let's see what happens if it's of looking at R, you look at R squared, you look at the plane. So imagine I drew the plane just here, like so this is a part of the plane obviously, but you can imagine this is the whole plane. So you can Again, like you can't take just this in, you know, in one piece. So let's try to split it in more pieces. So you can do this in a naive way using the, what's going on in one, uh, I mean, in one dimension with the, with the reels. And you can try and cut it this way. So you have this, you know, rectangles, they're paving the plane. And you can see, well, around every point, the most you can see is um, four different uh, pieces around yourself. So this would have dimension at most three. Except, you know, if you look at this picture, you'd be tempted to say, I'm not really being very clever here, right? Because there's a better way of doing this. You should just sliding every other uh, line so that, you know, there's never one point where you see four different pieces. Just making sure, you know, places where something changes in one line, there's nothing changing on the, on the next line. So this way, um, you can see that the plane, I still haven't defined to you properly what the dimension is, but hopefully you can sort of see that uh, the plane has dimension two. And well, actually it's kind of technical to argue properly, but um, intuitively you can try and convince yourself that there's no way you can get uh, below dimension two. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are tools to, to argue that uh, you cannot do better, but it's uh, yeah, a bit technical. But yeah, intuitively you can convince yourself of that. So that's just for, you know, reals, plane. I told you I would, I would tell you about uh, graph classes. So what could dimension be in a graph class or in a graph? So take your favorite graph. We said we wanted to cut the thing in small pieces. So you really what you're looking for is a collection of uh, sets, say CIs, which together span the whole vertex set of the graph. You want them to be small. So you're going to say, 
uh, every such set, every CI has bounded diameter uh, in the graph. We go back to what bounded means. And you want to make sure there is little contact. So what could contact be? So you want to say around every point, there is there are a few things happening. So the um, simplest definition would be to say, for every vertex in the graph, uh, you look at the um, number of different CIs uh, intersecting the close neighborhood, and you want that to be not too large. So that's exactly what I wrote here. So you have a graph trying to partition the vertex set. Everything should have small dimension, uh, sorry, small diameter. <laughs> And you want to minimize the number of different uh, sets you see, uh, every vertex sees around uh, in this neighborhood. So there's uh, an issue with that, which is that if you take your favorite graph and you just uh, divide, it, so divide every edge, say, three times, you're going to very easily have very small dimension. So in a way, it's important that you don't just look at things happening around one vertex. Like what's interesting could happen on a larger scale. Like you cannot find to be able to zoom in or out depending on, uh, on the structure of the graph. So instead of looking around every vertex, um, you're going to want to be able to choose what scale to look at the graph, like where to choose at what scale interesting things are going on. So does that mean? It means you cannot want to say, I pick my favorite scale and given the scale, so given this integer, R, which is going to present, you know, how, how far I'm seeing. Um, yeah, given the R, I will choose a partition of the vertex set, again, such that the diameter of every set is bounded in the graph, and such that now instead of looking at things at, uh, in the neighborhood, I can say everything, I mean, for every vertex, I look at things happening at distance at most R of it. So I really look at all the vertices, which, you know, are neighbors or neighbors of neighbors and so on, until I reach ball of uh, radius r around the vertex and I try to minimize um, how many different sets I can see there. So it's really a matter of uh, choosing the scale. I really want you to think about this as scaling the, um, uh, the dimension based on how interesting the graph is, like trying to figure out where uh, interesting things are happening. So okay, this is um, this is for the scale. So now I told you what contact should be. So contact really is like you choose actually what kind of contact you're going for and based on that uh, you're going to find the partition. I still haven't told you what bounded is. So what could it be? You're trying to say I want every set to have small diameter but you also want the set to depend on the scale you're looking at which means that if you're going for a constant, if you're going to try and bound the diameter by constant you're not going to be able to get anything very interesting, right? Because for a very large scale, then you know, you're know of course going to see many, many, many different sets if you bounded the diameter by constant. And you know, there's going to be a not very interesting behavior happening. So you have to bound it by some function. You want to say you know, it's bounded by some function of R or something. But if, it's, if you just say some function, then if it's just for a graph, then you can just take the function being you know, the size of the graph and then you just put everything in C1 and you're done, there's nothing very interesting going on. So it's a lot more interesting if you look at the graph class. So it's really, take your favorite graph class, you're going to wonder, is there a good choice of function f such that for every graph in my class, I can do what I just said, meaning I can choose a scale, no matter the scale, I will always be able to find a partition of a vertex set such that every set has Demeter, which is at most some function of R, which again only depends on the graph class, does not depend on the graph I'm looking at. Such that for every vertex, if I look at something that uh, on Freddy's R around, I don't see too many different things happening. So that, that's uh, one way to, to look at this uh, dimension. So really, if this is true, and if I can find a good uh, choice of function F, then uh, my graph class has dimension at most B. The funny thing is, that's an equivalent definition. It's not clear, it's not intuitive, say, that it's equivalent. Uh, it's the way it was introduced by Gromov in 1993. So he was interested in setting off um, group, th group theory, uh, geometric group, group theory, um, but it translates quite naturally to, to graphs. So let, let me read to you that way. So you want to say, so again, so it's very similar in flavor, but there are some differences. So you have a graph class, and you're going to say it has a certain dimension at most b, so that's you know what you want. 
if you can find a good choice of function f, still the same, such that for every graph in, in the class, you're going to be able to partition the vertex set into this time not arbitrary many pieces, but precisely d plus one pieces. So in this time, the dimension appears in the number of pieces you have. But what you're going to say now, instead of saying that the diameter of each thing has to be bounded, which seems you know, hard to guarantee if you only have a very small number of different pieces allowed, you're going to say that just um, every R component, I'm going to define that in a bit, uh, of each set, of each piece, has to have a uh, bounded diameter. So what's an R component? If you took R to be one, it would be exactly a connected, connected component. So, you know, it's easier to define by contraposite. So say a, a component is not a connected component if there are two vertices where there is no path between them. I mean, if there are two components, two sets with no path at all between them. So R component is also easier to define that way. So it's really generation of connected component. So going to say a set of vertices in G, so it's really like relative to the graph it's living in, you'd say it's not an R component if you can find two subsets I mean, if you can partition the set into two pieces, such that there, there is no path of length at most r between them. So again, connected component, you were saying, you know, you cannot find, you cannot split into two parts where there is no path at all between them, so no edge at all between them. Here, uh, it's really saying no path of length r in the rest of the graph between them. So it's really, yeah, I want you to think about this as a set of vertices where, so it's connected if you allow little jumps uh, in the rest of the graph, like little jumps outside the component in the rest of the graph, but the jumps are size at most r, I mean, at most r edges uh, outside, so r minus one vertices um, outside. And so it's not intuitive to me uh, why these two definitions are equivalent. Actually, to prove this, you need some deep trick, something called Kolmogorov trick. If you know about this, you understand. If you don't, that's completely fine. We don't, we don't actually need to, to know what's going on there. Just say these, these two things are equivalent. So they don't necessarily have to be true with the same function f, and it's not clear, you know, given, I mean, it's quite clear given things in the second case, it's quite clear that you can derive stuff in the first case, but the converse is absolutely not straightforward because you might have to merge some CIs and stuff, and like, it's not, it's not necessarily true that you could get the same function in both cases, but at least the two different equivalent in terms of dimension. So uh, you can think of one or the other depending on which one you're most comfortable with. I'm, I'm aware this is very technical. I will give examples in just a bit, uh, and hopefully this will all be very, very clear. Uh, before I do that, though, let me add some motivation for this, and not some motivation, but links to stuff you might be more aware of. So there's this definition of Micromorph coming from geometric group theory. And you also have links with standard, well, almost standard coloring, uh, because if you take the special case of uh, scale R being one, that's exactly something called weak diameter coring. So you're just, you know, having a normal coring, you know, good old coring uh, of vertices of the graph. You just say that um, for every color you look at, every connected component has a bounded diameter. And this is somewhat related to something called clustered coring, where instead of bonding the diameter of a component, you're bonding the size of a component. So this is a stronger, stronger requirement, but if you are in a graph class where everything has bonded uh, debris, then this is equivalent. So there are some connections to that, some connections there, at least in some graph classes. And another funny thing, in my opinion, is that this is almost exactly what's going on. I mean, what uh, some people in TCS are interested in, which is called weak sparse partition schemes. I'm not going to define this properly. Uh, so it's essentially exactly what's going on with uh, small dimension, except that you cannot have a trade-off between dimension and dimension. And you care a lot about whether you can compute them in polynomial time. But I, the message I really want to send here is that this is studied in lots of different settings for different reasons, like with focus on different pieces. But it's not so much studied in, in the context of graph classes. And one of the points of my talk is to try and convince you that you should work on this, or at least you should uh, care a bit uh, about this. But it's, I think it's an interesting problem. Okay, I promised you examples. Let me give you examples. Um, let's do trees. Trees, you know, that's, that doesn't seem very scary. So the example we saw with uh, reals, that tells you that paths are, are fine, you know, paths behave exactly like the reals in some sense. 
So you can easily prove that the class of path has dimension one. It's not very, very hard. But with trees, you know, it can go in, you can have a very large uh, degree and stuff like that. It's not so obvious how, how to partition things. Like you can't just have intervals and stuff because you need to control how they explode, how they branch, etc. Et so let's take a tree. You want to say, you want to argue somehow the class of trees has bounded dimension. How do you do this? So you take a vertex in the tree. I mean, you can assume the tree is connected because you know if it's not, just do every component independently, everything is fine. So let's assume it's connected. Um, take a vertex, do a BFS from it. So really look at vertices distance one, distance two, distance three, and so on. And we're going to partition the vertices based on that uh, BFS layering. So I drew you here some picture in the sense that, so you have your vertex U, something happened before, you don't really care what, so you have like, you know, some L layers before. You're looking at things at scale R, so you're doing to try and partition so that, you know, the diameter is bonus function of R and around the vertex, you don't see too many things happening at distance R of yourself. Um, so after, you know, so something happened before, you don't really care. You're just going to look at three consecutive layers here uh, of size 2R. So you remember R is your scale, and you kind of want to control, like you want to partition such a way that things, you know, don't interact too much again. So you have these three bands of uh, height 2R. So you really, again, like the bottom of the layer, each layer, the distance 2R of the, of the top. So let me just tell you how to partition the bottom layer, and then hopefully I can convince you that you can do this everywhere, and you know, the partitioning scheme works. So you look at things happening on the top of the second layer, so on this line here. I hope you can see my mouse. So you have, you look at the vertices exactly here, so distance, well, 2R plus L exactly of, of you. Um, let's pick two vertices arbitrarily, V and W. You're going to do this for all vertices, but it, to convince you, you only need to look at two. You look at the uh, descendants in the, in the tree from you. So the, the, the dis dis descendants of V, are completely disjoint from the sense of W because we're in a tree and you know we're at some point in the BFS, so you know there's no risk of things merging again. And what we're going to do is just say we don't do anything for the first layer after V and W, but for the last layer, we're just going to say all distance of V here gets in one set and all distance of W there gets in one set. So we do this, you know, for every vertex at distance exactly, I mean uh, every vertex in the in the line where VW is, we do this, and we do this actually for every, at every frontier between two consecutive um, bands. So now let's think about what can happen. So say you're a vertex, you live in this tree, you're somewhere, say you, you're somewhere in the top of CV. How many, how many different C something can you see? So you can see something on the top, for example. But if you see something from the top, it means you're close enough to the top of the band that you don't see anything at the bottom. So vertically wise, you can only see uh, one person. I mean, you can only see either above or below, but not both. So you can only see one person. Uh, I mean, one other see something vertically. And horizontally, how could you be, you know, too close to some? How could you be a distance at most R for some other sets? Like the shortest path from CV to CW has to go all the way back to V, then through the band, maybe actually a lot higher then to through W and back. So whatever happens, the path is length more than for R. So there's no way you see anything horizontally. So really in each band this way, you essentially have just connected components, well, R connected components um, of bounded diameter and that's it. So this way you can make sure uh, the class of trees has a specific dimension to, uh, sorry, that one. <laughs> so you have contact two and you know, that's the difference of one between number of contacts, meaning how many sets you can see um, and dimension. So the vertex can see, I mean, a distance R can see at most two sets, so dimension one. It's exactly like path. Trees are very nice. So one thing which might be disturbing to you, I don't know, is that if you think about what CV looks like, it's very not connected. I mean, it could be connected if it's like degenerate, but in most cases, it's not going to be connected. And that's completely okay. Uh, meaning in the definition, we really care about the diameter in the graph. We don't really care, I mean, we do not want to care about the diameter in the graph induced by the component. And actually, even for trees, 
if you were to enforce that, you know, if you were to use the same definition as before, but say every CI has to be connected, then you would have actually unbounded dimension. Like if you just take even a binary tree, there is no way to fit this into community components such a way that you have bounded contact. Even if you allow you know, things to overlap or anything, it's completely hopeless. So that's a good reason why we care about the diameter of the sets in G and um, not, in, not in, uh, in the graph induced by the component. Do you have any question until now? Or should I move on to more complicated examples? <laughs> okay, feel free to interrupt later uh, if you change your mind or you have some more, yes, for some clarification on the definition. So yeah, so I told you in this definition, we think we care about partitioning stuff which is such that everything has a uh, small diameter and you don't have too much contact and stuff. And I told you trees are nice, but if you think about it, if you were to add some big cliques somewhere in the tree, would it really ruin much? Like whenever you have a big clique, it has very, very small diameter, it's just diameter one. And as long as they, these cliques will not interact too much with each other, then there's no reason why things would go wrong. And she can convince yourself that with the scheme I just presented, like if you had a of trees that had color graphs, which are essentially trees where you blow up every vertex into cliques in, a, in, in some way, then you still, I mean, the same thing will still work in the sense that you'd still be able to get to argue that the class of color graphs has dimension one. So it's really, it's not so much about tree, like, you know, trees are things which don't have a cycle. I mean, that's the that's usual definition of trees. Well, for us, we, we say we only care about kinetic components. But actually, it's not so much, you know, what matters for the proof is not that actually that they have no cycle, because you could have, for example, if you had a really long cycle, but there would be one patek seeing it all, then it would behave, you know, just like a star, essentially, because you don't really care about these uh, extra edges. So, you know, the thing which makes this scheme works is not so much having a cycle. It's having no fat cycle. Uh, I'll define this in a bit, I mean, right now. <laughs> so what's fatness? Like, how do you generalize, you know, not enough trees, but actually anything, like, how do you um capture the fact that if you have a one big cycle but there's one vertex in it all then it's not a big deal or you know the fact that you can have if you have a large clique then it's also not a big deal how, how do you capture that so this notion of fatness where so you're going to have something like i mean you're going to look at minors so here i define something called a banana it's like a really just a theta um so what's a fat banana um, so you're just going to have two blobs here, A and B, and you want to make sure they're far away from each other, and they have free path from one to the other, but this free path, well, they have to be long because these sets are far from each other, but also they have to be far from each other. So it's really all these conditions here. So you have, you really want to have these two connected blobs, just like a minor, and you want to have this free path from one to the other, but you want to make sure, you know, things are fat in the sense that they're far away from each other and they don't, they don't, interact with each other in the sense that you can't cover them all nicely with just, you know, a cheap number of uh, pieces. And just to illustrate a bit more the concept, um, I expect most of you are familiar with the notion of uh, click minor. So let's say, you know, you have a K3 minor, it's actually a fat cycle, but uh, you can imagine, you know, this is actually a Q fat K 10,000 minor, if you like. I just didn't draw the 10,000 vertices. Um, so you have these three connected blobs, you know, just like a normal minor. And again, like you require the same path as you would in a normal minor, but you say all those paths has to be far away from each other. So again, it's really about saying cliques or anything which has small diameter is uh, easy to handle. What's really important here is, you know, things which are not easy to handle. And what kind of thing cannot be easy to handle? Well, it's something which behaves, you know, like a clique or, you know, something which normally we're not happy with except that everything is far away from each other, so that it really occupies a lot of space, if that makes sense. So the, the scheme we have for trees is actually saying that um, for any Q, if you have, if you look at the graph class with no Q fat banana, you have dimension one, same scheme whatsoever. It's really just saying, you know, uh, the real thing making the, the scheme works for trees doesn't care if you have small things attached to it. Like the only thing which can make it ruin is exactly um, the Q fat banana. Really hate bananas. Anyway, 
So why is this interesting? Like, why am I telling you about QFAT bananas? Like, don't expect to see them uh, in real life usually. So let me tell me let me tell you about the next generation of trees. So you know, we had these examples with reels and then the plane, and I told you about paths and trees. The next obvious step is what happens for planographs. So for planographs, this is this nice theorem of uh, Fujiwara and Papasoglu Papa from Machi this year, I think it was February, uh, where they prove that the class of planographs actually has a subjective dimension at most three. Actually, the way the way to do that, if you go back to what I told you about for trees. Is very similar. So again, it's about having BFS. So, you know, you do one BFS, you look at some uh, band of like some given width, which is some function of R. And this time, you know, it's it's not it's not going to be as nice as it was for a tree. But what you can try to say is that um, it's kind of like an autoplanograph. It's not quite an autoplanograph, you know. But if you look from really far away, you could almost believe it's an autoplanograph. And then you could say, okay, other banana graphs seem more encouraging. Actually, they have, they have no fed banana. And then you could try and say, okay, let me take a VFS again in that band. So I'm, you know, I'm hiding technical details, so it's probably obvious. But um, yeah, so the idea is we have this, have take one VFS, have those bands, and in each band do VFS, VFS again. And then you can use the thing, you know, have contact two. But then if you do this in a way, you know, every vertex say W here. Would have you know would see two different balls. Uh, I mean, be see a distance at most r two different sets, see something from below, and also maybe also two from above, and then you would get you know contact four, so dimension three. So that's um, essentially what makes the proof of Fujiwara Papasoglu work. So they really say yeah you have a simple dimension at most three. We know well yeah we know um, from the case of plane. That planar graphs do not have a, I mean, that they have a split dimension at least two. So the big question is, you know, is it two or it is three? And to answer that, I really need to tell you um, how to use this notion of Kiefer banana. I need to tell you about some theorem of uh, Brodsky, Didak, Levin, and Mitra uh, from 12 years ago, which, I mean, it was studied in, in context of metric spaces, but that's not very far away from graph classes. So informally, if you have a graph class, where for every graph in that class, you can find a layering. For those of you who don't know what layering is, think BFS uh, layering. So you're taking bands of arbitrary, uh, yeah. So if you can find a layering such that any constant number of consecutive layers induce a graph from another graph class, for sure, then the dimension of your graph class is at most one more than the dimension of that other graph class, which you know, kind of um, appears uh, for any any constant number of consecutive layers in your layering. So it's really saying if you can if you can see if you can observe that there is a simple structure for any consecutive number of layers, then you're happy. So for trees, you know, what happens is we we say for any consecutive number constant consecutive number of layers, we essentially see. Um, all these joint connected components of bond diameter, which have you know dimension zero, and it's essentially why trees have dimension at most well one more, so one. And now for planographs, I, you know I kind of hinted at it saying if you take a planograph, do a BFS, you can hope that you know the each band in the in the BFS tree looks like an autoplanograph. So it's formally you know they don't have any fat banana essentially for good notion of fatness, I mean, for a good cue in, in the fatness. And then, you know, you can use the same schema for trees and say, um, yeah, exactly that. So, and say that um, planar graphs have that in dimension numbers too, well, so precisely too. Actually, take your favorite surface, as soon as its genus is bonded, then the class of graphs, which are embeddable in that surface, for sure have a sensitive dimension too. And this is tight because, as I said, you know, as soon as you can have path, uh, not path, as soon as you can have, you know, planes there, um, for sure you have, you cannot have a sensitive dimension one. So, you know, it's precisely two. So it's at least two at most two. So it's precisely two. So this is what happens for um, a sensitive dimension in planar graphs and actually more generally surfaces of bonded genus. What will be the next step? So. Next step, I, I hope I convince you the next step is to look at uh, KT minor free graphs. So 
there's this nice theorem from five years ago from Mosowski and Rosenthal uh, saying that pick, pick your favorite size of click. If you look at the class of graphs with no kt minor, then for sure it's dimensions at most four to the t. So that's nice. Let's say it's bonded. So actually, the intuition behind the scheme is not is not terribly hard. It's exactly again this BFS uh, scheme. So take a kt minor free graph. Uh, take one BFS, you know, look at one band, hope that this, these things here are a bit simpler, you know, do a BFS again, and again, and again. And the idea is, you know, you hope that after some time, the structure will be very, very simple. Actually, that's the part which is, which is hard, like you're going to be able to say, that's a nice theorem saying that if you do these T steps, then for sure you just get, you know, tiny components of actually even, yeah, of bonded diameter. Um, so then, you know, you kind of go back in the BFS layering and you can see, you know, each time you multiply the number of contacts by at most four, so you get this bound of four to the T. I mean, again, I'm sweeping a lot of uh, details under the carpet, but really the idea is having this nested BFS and really hope that, you know, structures get simpler and simpler uh, as you go. And actually, funnily, um, the same arguments would work if you look at uh, fat KT minors. Like if you forbid, I mean, if you include fatness in the, forbidden minor, then it also just goes through. It's just even um, simpler in a way in the proof, but uh, let me not go into that. So you have this upper bound of four to the T, and you know, naive question is, okay, why is it exponential? Could it be, could it be improved? Um, it's kind of hard to uh, get a nice understanding of what's going on in one band. Like if you look at KT minor three, like what, what would be, why would one band be a lot simpler? Um, than the whole graph. And there's this very frustrating, intriguing question um, from the same people who proved planar graphs of the ascii dimension number three. They asked, is there any reason to believe that it's not just a constant? Could it be that for every t, every ferry t, I mean, of course you have to fix it, but pick your ferry t, then actually the dimension of kt of your graph should be a constant, and actually even more than a constant, like why is it not two? Do you have any reason to believe it's not just two? So it's really, really hard to improve the upper band here. Uh, we've spent some time on it. Like um, you can try, I mean, you can improve the, um, uh, the base, but it's really hard to get to something sub-exponential. So that's a massive gap between, you know, best upper bound, best lower bound. And it's also frustrating that it seems, you know, in a way that, um, we don't mind KT minors if they're not fat in some sense. So it really seems like the question should be about fat KT minor free um, graph for some question, for some, in some way. But as I said, like this, this upper bound is really, it's really hard to imagine how to improve, uh, the, I mean, improve this in a significant way, say. But maybe, you know, it seems hard to believe that the answer for this would really be to, like it seems, Intriguing, you know, to that that the KT minor free graph will have dimension at most two. So let's see, let's see what kind of lower bounds we can get in general. Like, how how do you even prove a graph class has a large has large dimension? That's something which is um, actually even harder than proving upper bounds. So that's why you know it's more interesting to just try and improve the upper bounds as much as possible instead of trying to build uh, lower bounds. So the standard example. Of something of a graph of a class which has you know the dimension you like is that of uh, d-dimensional grids. So essentially, it's, it's, I told you about what happens to, with uh, real, so with R. I told you about R to the D. I told you that intuitively you can see dimension should not be less than um, than two. Uh, I told you that there's something called chromograph trick to to argue properly. You know that indeed that's the bound. Actually, you can then use this to prove for R to the D in general. Actually exactly uh, in the same way for d-dimensional grids that um, has dimension exactly d. So yeah, look at all d-dimensional grids, for sure this has dimension d. That's the only graph class, nice graph class we have where we know exactly what's going on in some sense. There are other cases where we can control what's going on. So d-dimensional grids, you can see, well, they have you know, a large degree. That you can say, you can show that some cubic graphs have actually unbounded dimension. So just because you bound the max degree doesn't mean you're going to win. 
Uh, there are some cubic expanders uh, which have an unbounded dimension. And I don't want to go much into details, but there are some other graphs with max degree four, uh, which have some nice structure, etc., which have unbounded dimension. That's a very, very recent paper as well. Seems like a lot of things are happening, you know, recently in the area of aspect dimension. So that's lots of um, things to understand. And yeah, it's it's very frustrating to me that that's the best we can say in terms of uh, in terms of lava bounds for for this kind of um, of question. So let me tell you a little bit. I mean, now <laughs> essentially the message about lab bounds is well, we don't have many. You have to work with well cubic expanders or the dimensional grids if you want to prove much um, about this. Um, let me tell you a bit about you know how asymptotic dimension connects with with uh, other parameters. So there are lots of you know. Lots of measures of sparseness uh, or sparsity in, in a graph. So asymptotic dimension is not so much about sparseness because, you know, as I said, you can have arbitrary large cliques and you read your mind uh, as long as it has small diameter. So it's looking out for something else. But it could be, you know, that whenever you are sparse for some good national sparse, then you for sure have small asymptotic dimension. Um, so we know just finding max degree doesn't work because of cubic expanders, but there's still hope for some other uh, measures of sparsity. And one, one example of that is uh, the notion of growth of a graph class. So you say a class of graphs of growth at most f is essentially, I mean, the, the growth essentially measures uh, how the number of vertices in an airball, airball grows when r grows. So it's really, um, you'd say you have growth at most f, I mean, some function. If for every vertex in your graph, if you look at how many vertices you have a distance at most r of you, then for sure it's at most that function of r. And that's that's notion of growth. It's really yeah, seeing how far you how fast your graph grow, graph gr grows um, as you go further away from a vertex. So what happens if you have a graph class with growth uh, at most f? Can you say anything about the something dimension? So if the growth is polynomial. Actually, using again this layering trick, this time not a BFS, but an actual proper layering, um, you can argue that yeah, if f is polynomial meaning is bounded by some polynomial function, then for sure your graph class has a bounded dimension. There's no way to avoid that. Like, if you yeah, if you graph polynomial, then your aspect dimension is bounded. There's some very specific weird case, which is a notion of if the function is degenerate. So. It's actually an important case uh, in some sense. So degenerate means, you know, regardless of how the function behaves in the rest of the cases, there is some r, some value of r, for which uh, f is at f of r is at most three r. So why is that value important? It's an important value because if you look at a much, much, much subdivided uh, graph, if you take a vertex of degree at least three, I mean precisely three actually. The number of vertices you see around a distance r is 3r plus 1. So if you know for some r you cannot have this, it means you know the graph really cannot grow very fast, cannot grow essentially at all. Like it has to look like, you know, with lots of quotes around look like uh, a path or a cycle essentially. Um, so then you know uh, no matter what the function f is like in the rest, you know, as soon as you have one value where this is the case, you have dimension one for sure. So it's really a degenerate, degenerate case. And then what's the, what's the remaining case? So the remaining case is, you know, it's not polynomial. So it's not bounded by a polynomial function. And it's not the right, meaning it's at least three R plus one for every, for every R. And the thing which is interesting uh, to me is that if your growth function is, well, neither polynomial nor the right, then you know your graph class could have unbound dimension, meaning there is no value of F other than polynomial degenerate which guarantees bounded dimension. So essentially what you do is you take, you take the, um, an appropriate size, uh, sorry, an appropriate D, look at the all D dimensional grids, and you're just going to blow up, and you're going to subdivide every edge like lots and lots and lots of time to ensure you know, it doesn't grow too fast. And for every vertex, you're going to replace it with also much subdivided binary tree, just trying you to kind of slow the growth as much as possible. And then for sure, no matter which function f you're aiming for, there's a way to, there's a way to do this enough that 
for every r of the growth at, mo at most uh, f of r. And then you know you can you can show essentially that the when you do this, the dimension does not change, so you still have dimension d for whichever d you like. So it's not possible um, to have a bound, no matter which function f uh, you're hoping for. So a thing which um, is funny here is that at first, when we started studying this notion of subsequent dimension, we thought that um, sparsity could not help for subsequent dimension, because we thought that the case of uh, one planar graphs, for example, like uh, we thought that whenever um, uh, I mean, we just observed that essentially a subtle dimension behaves well with respect to subdivisions. If you subdivide every edge many times, then you know dimension essentially is not impacted because you have this way of scaling. So if you just you know subdivide everything ten thousand times, well, you just multiply your scale by ten thousand, still see the same picture essentially. So we had this idea that subdivision does not impact anything, which means you know take a favorite graph, subdivide it enough, it's a one planar graph. And you know, one plane graphs are sparse, of course, good notional sparse, which is the which was our you know reason to believe that uh, if you're sparse, then for sure you have um, I mean you, you for sure you cannot ensure uh, that you have bounded aspect dimension. But the small trick here is that the subdivision has to depend on the graph, right? Depending on which graph you're looking at, you have to subdivide it a lot and a lot more to make it one planar. I mean, before you can make it one planar. And that's the issue, right? You could train to do it for a graph class, not for a given graph. And that's actually one uh, big open question for us. Um, like, big, you know, it behaves well with respect to subdivision, but you have to make sure subdivisions are uniform, you know, over the graph class. You can't subdivide every graph arbitrarily much, otherwise, you know, there's nothing much to see anyway. Like, uh, um, yeah, it has to, it has to be subdivided a bounded, bounded number of times. So it could actually be that one pair of graphs have a unbounded dimension. That's a very surprising uh, case in a way for me. Everything we have so far just fails for one planar graph somehow. Just because, you know, in, in whenever you do a BFS layering on the one planar graph, then there's absolutely no reason why uh, one layer would be simpler than, uh, than the whole graph, essentially. Just because, you know, since you allow edges crossing and stuff, you don't have really this notion of outer planar-like graph. And yeah, depending on the day I oscillate between, you know, saying it should be bounded or could be arbitrary large. So it's really unclear um, what's the right answer here. And there's this very disturbing question about fat miners, you know, that we can prove um, for every t, if you have no fat kt minor, then you should have, you know, dimension that must go to, go to the t. But the conjecture, I mean, the conjecture is actually with no fatness, saying just that um, kt minor free graph should have dimension two. I mean, yeah, precisely two. And it's really hard to understand what's going on here. It's really hard to see how to make like a say general statement saying if you can't say anything for h minor free graphs, then you should be able to say something for fat h minor free graphs. It's kind of disturbing in some sense that it's such an intuitive notion that, you know, of course, if you glue some stuff to things and they don't interact much with the rest, then you should be fine. But it's hard to, uh, yeah, have a full argument why uh, this should be helpful in any way. Um, I think that's that's all I wanted to say. So thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, okay, I have a question. So you you seem to focus a lot on on miners here. Is there a particular reason that minor closed classes are of interest and you couldn't look at kind of induced subgraph closed classes or something like that? So the thing is like if you try to forbid any induced subgraph, because of this subdivision trick, it would have to contain no cycle. Mm -hmm. And because of the trick I hinted to hinted at uh, for the you know lava bound on polynomial growth, uh, sorry on super polynomial growth, mm -hmm. you can you know replace every vertex with like some big enough binary tree. So your the so induced subgraph you forbid has to be you know max degree three um, graph and also so yes yeah, so max, max degree three graph for rest and also uh, degree three vertices cannot be in the same component so you'd be forbidding you know essentially a collection of clues of subdivided clues okay and then I believe it would have bounded uh, dimension so yeah we did not study this but we have the answer. <laughs> 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 
I see. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, because like it, yeah, because of the scaling, essentially you can avoid to run into too many things in some sense. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? And feel free to type them in the chat, and I can read them out if you prefer. Well, if not, then uh, thank you again, Mart. I'll stop the recording now.